Dr. Sosa. Hey. So a lot of folks come in here. Dr. Civic. Um, all right, this is awesome. So the room is filling up. It looks like we're live on Facebook. Look at your <laughs> head and neck pain. Yep, TMD is going to be the topic this evening. That's for sure. Um, hey, Rochelle. Shut them off. Okay, Dr. Behrman. All right, so we have the room filling up. We have folks on Facebook. I'm gonna give it a second for more people to trickle in here. Okay. All right, so let's go ahead and do this here. I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. All right, well, to get started, I do want to welcome everybody for another episode of Sleep TV this evening. Um, I am joined here again by our SGS president, John Nadeau, and the wonderful Dr. Damien Blum, who has been a wonderful friend and mentor to me over the years. And he'll be joining us this evening to discuss um, tonight's topic of triage the triad, uh, which is gonna be covering um, some tops of topics such as um, obstructive sleep apnea, TMD, et cetera. So Dr. Blum, my dear, thank you so much for joining us this evening. Uh, thank you. Thank, hey, thank hey. you very much for joining us. Listen, it's great to be here again. It's been quite a hiatus, right? So exactly. uh, we're going to talk tonight about something that's super important. Uh, you know, a lot of people are treating OSA, mm -hmm. obstructive sleep apnea. A lot of people are treating TMD or oral facial pain. Well, you have to have a way of figuring out what the problem is with the patient, what the problem is not with the patient. And that will allow you to have a much more successful treatment. So one of the things we need to do is come up with um, questionnaires and, and screeners to be able to tell what is going on with the patient. And these are so simple that anyone in the office at all, anyone who can read can administer these questionnaires and even the patient can do it themselves. So Cindy, go on to the next. So the objective of this webinar, okay, will be to be able to discern how to, how to do this questionnaire, which is again, quite simple. You can do it over the phone before a patient even comes to the office and it can be done by the person who answers the phones. Uh, it can be done at the hygiene visit. It can be done in a dental chair by a patient care coordinator or a dental assistant, sleep care coordinator. And all this can be done and should be done prior to the dentist even entering the room. Cindy, can we go next slide, please? Yeah, triage, what is triage? A process of deciding which patients are likely to be at greatest risk for a serious condition. And when you triage, it's how you decide where you're gonna send the patient, meaning what, what is it that you're going, what is the problem and what it is that you're going to be doing. Next, next slide. So it's efficient, very easy screening. Now, this is what we need to understand. The prevalence of orofacial pain or temporal mandibular joint disorders in the general population is upwards of 34%. Well, that's pretty high. That's basically one out of every three of your patients may have issues with this. And the older the population, the more likely to, to, for you to have an even higher percentage of these patients with the problems. So we need to identify those patients with risk factors for TMD, OFP, and if we're gonna be treating them for obstructive sleep apnea, we need to know if there are these underlying conditions because that may affect the success of what it is that you're doing. Understand that patients with obstructive sleep apnea have a much higher prevalence of TMJ disorders, over 60%. So, you know, when you do your therapy for, for OSA with oral appliance therapy, and if the patient has symptoms or history of, of uh, T 
TMD, you may be more likely you're going to be taking care of both of these problems with the same appliance, with your same therapy. But if as the patient wears the appliance, they start to develop some issues, some pain, you need to know where it's coming from, why they have it, and you need to be able to know how to treat it. Okay. Can I have the next slide, please? So to evaluate now, studies were done even back in 2011, 2009, and 2013. And these studies show, can you go back and click, that the different studies, one showed that 58%, 58% of the patients, um, TMD patients who suffered from OSA. That's pretty high. The next study, uh, their results showed that 75% of the patients suffered from OSA also. And the next one even went up to 80%. Now on the next slide, what you're going to see is that the cumulative prevalence of TMD among OSA patients is above 66%. And that's what you need to know. So are they interconnected? Yes. Can they show the same symptoms? Yes. Can you look in the math and see the same issues with both disorders? Yes. And the outside of the face, you'll see some problems as well. And I'm gonna show you in a soon upcoming slide. So, uh, you know, what's interesting. I was reading this morning, uh, something that just came through. Uh, look how new these are, October 16th. Two articles, one is, was done in the state of Maryland, which is where I live. And surveys were done, or studies were done in hospitals and nursing homes, as far as uh, what, what they found is that it was a colonization of two uh, pathogens that were common in patients receiving mechanical ventilation. That's pretty interesting. We've known that there are issues associated with cleaning and, and other things as well, but this was a study that was done that actually showed that that is a problem. The next one uh, to the right says brain fungal infection produces Alzheimer's disease, like changes um, in the new study. And this was just recently um, reported out of Baylor College of, Den uh, College of Medicine. And we knew that eventually, um, if you have OSA long enough, and let's say you're not diagnosed or it's not treated or what have you, you start to develop early dementia and Alzheimer's in some of these patients. We knew that there were these proteins, those sticky proteins called amyloid beta proteins. And we know that they're in there and we needed to get them out. And we do that through the lymphatic system, what we call a meningeal wash. So what this study from Baylor did is they saw not only the, what the agent is, which is candida albicans, by the way, um, which causes problems in, in many parts of your body, but that fungal infection from candida can enter the brain. It activates two separate mechanisms in the brain cells that open up, open up the, the blood brain barrier and allows candida to go in and infect the brain and get these gunky proteins out. We need to get the sufficient and significant levels of, uh, of, of blood flow, nutrients, and particularly oxygen to do this lymphatic system wash, the meningeal wash. And this is how we can get these amyloid beta proteins out so that a patient can be more viable for a lot longer time. Can I have the next slide, please? So symptoms of OSA, heavy snoring, you stop breathing. You know, you know, many of you who are already treating OSA patients know this. And a lot of you actually probably know this anyway from things you've read about it. But these are all symptoms that the patients can report to you in the dental office, right? heavy snoring, stop breathing, high blood pressure, morning headaches, restless sleep. And a lot of these patients will also have significant numbers of medications to deal with these problems. 
And these are all red flags. Everything here is a red flag. And in high levels of medications that the patients take, those are red flags too. But on the right side of the screen, where it says short-term memory loss and intellectual deterioration, this is what you need to look for as far as candida albicans going in and, and damaging the brain. So let's move on to the next one. So those were the symptoms of OSA, and there are physical signs of it. Everyone that looks in a patient's mouth will see these signs. In the past, you may have looked in there and written down what you saw, but you may not have known what to do with it. When you're treating patients for OSA, and when you learn these things, learn how to treat the patients, these things make sense, all of them. You know, what do you do with this? And not only what do you do with it, how did they develop and how can you correct it? You may have to do some dentistry, but I haven't touched the tooth in years and I'm treating these patients without that. So sometimes you can do it yourself. Usually you have an MD involved in that. Um, sometimes you have your primary care physician, a sleep physician, an ENT. Uh, gastroenterologists, psychiatrists, cardiologists. So all these people are your friends and you should establish relationships with all of them so that you can develop this really nice network of clinicians. So when you look at this picture, by the way, you look at that tongue and you saw how large it is. You see something like this coming at you. Open up. And look further back because you're going to see multiple other problems as well. So in, in the next slide, if you go past the tongue and you, go, you try to look at the back of the throat, uh, can we go to the tonsils? One back. Now, <laughs> I know it's tricky, isn't it? Yeah, you put some mechanics in here. Give me one second. Sorry about that. Sorry about that. So here are the tonsils. Now, technically, you should be able to breathe quite well. In this patient, at least 75% or more of the airspace from left to right is being blocked by excessive tissue. And it's affecting uh, the uvula. It's affecting, pretty much, it's affecting the patient's breathing. And if their tongue is big on top of that, uh, it's amazing that some of these people can actually breathe at all, and that they wake up each morning. So let's go to the next slide. So the next slide is going to show you the size of the tongue. Now, the tongue is a crucial aspect here because the more you have this problem and the smaller your mouth, the larger the tongue appears and the more damage it can do. In this case, if you take a look, the tongue is covering the entire uh, lower arch. So that's pretty big. Now, what is it? Is the tongue big? Is the tongue too big? The tongue is big for the mouth. And it's like there's too much furniture in the room. So what do we need to do here? We need to look. We need to test this patient. We need to put them on our uh, equipment, technology, if you have that. If not, you should probably get it. But uh, I use a rhinometer and a pharyngometer, and I have done so for well over a decade. And that allows me to see uh, how the airway collapses how significant that collapse is. And it also allows me to see whether I can help this patient and find the right position that will open the airway and reduce the risk of collapse. Next, please. High pallor of vault. This is something else you'll see. When you see that crowded area like this, um, you see that patient with a significant overjet and overbite and very crowded in the front. A lot of times you're going to see a high palatal vault. If you see a high palatal vault, then look under the tongue, have them stick their tongue out and put the tongue to the roof of the mouth because you will almost certainly find ankylos, uh, ankyloglossia, ankylosed tongue. You're going to have the lingual frenum not allowing the tongue to move properly, which is what created this high palatal vault that you see here. And when that happens, a lot of times you're going to see patients with deviated septums 
and they're going to have an, uh, an inability in, at, at some level to breathe through their nose. So they end up breathing more through their mouth. And that's a problem. Let's go to the next one, please. Again, narrow arches, narrow arch form and loss of arch length. These are all problems. And we can start to see this in the very young children. We see adults a lot because these kids were missed growing up. So now we have to treat them as adults and we can. Next, please. And here's the tongue. Scallop tongue is how we call this. And this is from excessive forcing the tongue to open the airway. It pushes against the teeth so much that it has left forensic signs of bruxism and airway problems. Now, what happens is you have muscles under the tongue that join the, the, the chin, right? Genial glossus muscles. And you have muscles from the back of the tongue that go to the anterior wall of the, of the, of the pharynx, your breathing tube, right? That's your glossopharyngeal muscles. And as we bring the mandible forward, down and forward, once we measure it, as to where it needs to go, it helps to bring the jaw forward, the tongue forward, and the anterior aspect of the breathing tube forward. And this is basically how it um, greatly uh, reduces the risk of collapse of the airway. That's how you help the patients. It's, it's not rocket science. It's just sensible stuff. Let's move forward. And this is another one. When you look there, you, you see that that's a battered, very battered uvula and soft palate. Let's next. And when I see this, it just amazes me that this patient can even breathe. Okay, this should have been dealt with when this patient was a child, but now we have to deal with it accordingly. And we can very effectively. Next. So th that was OSA. Now let's look at the symptoms of, of TMD. You start with headaches, TMJ pain, swallowing issues, lose teeth, bruxing, clenching, uh, dizziness, tinnitus, or tinnitus, whichever way you want to say it, which by the way, patients with OSA develop these same, same issues. So as you continue moving forward, I think there's more stuff. Okay, a lot of these problems, you, you need to identify that they are TMD, but you're going to see them in OSA patients too. Can we go to the next one? Okay, now in here, the TMD signs, you see extra oral signs where you start to look at the patient now. You see facial asymmetry, edema or swelling, uh, hypertrophy. Uh, this was this is a patient. You're looking at a torticollis, mandibular or cervical torticollis. Uh, essentially, is a um, a super super muscle cramp, basically. And what it does is uh, these triggers, these trigger points, constrict the muscle, usually unilaterally, unilaterally, and cause the patient's mandible shift. Now, what causes this? It could be trauma. It could be a really bad sleeping position. Um, babies are born like that sometimes because of uh, badly positioned head and neck uh, in utero. And when they're born, they have torticollis and they, there's a way to deal with them as well. Just like you can deal with the adults. Next. So now the TMD signs intraorally. Now you're looking at Pretty much similar things that you see in patients with obstructive sleep apnea, right? You can see the midline discrepancies. The arches aren't lined up, right? Wear facets on, on the dentition, whether it's anteriors or posteriors, crowded lower anteriors. You see all these red flags. Now that I should tell you is TMD, OSA, it could be both, but you'll study that. Next. Okay, so let's go to the next one. Uh, now, in order to be able to assess these things, obviously you see that there's a lot to learn, but there are simple ways 
of deciding where to go. The TMD screener can be given again by absolutely anybody in the office, including the patient, but have someone in the office that, uh, administer that. It's a lot easier to do so. Okay, let's go to the next one. The reason we should all employ a TMD screener is because many patients suffer, have suffered all their lives from undiagnosed TMD or undiagnosed obstructive sleep apnea. But some of these um, problems can be so severe, these pains, that they will mimic more serious conditions such as neuralgia, sinus infections, um, pulpitis and dental infections, and God knows how many dental procedures patients have suffered through uh, all over the world because whoever was doing it did not understand about muscle issues and TMD problems. So we need to make sure that we know where we're going. Next. So a lot of these patients that come in with TMD, suspected TMD disorders, um, will come in different categories. The pains will come in different categories. Headaches will come in different categories. And what we need to look at is we will look at is um, musculoskeletal and orofacial pain. That one, that's what presents to our office the most, whether it's headaches, jaw pain, or anything associated with that. Could be in our head, could be in the neck area, in the shoulders, uh, very, very spreads out quite distinctly. So it could be musculoskeletal pain, neurovascular pain, or neuropathic pain, right? Or these headaches as well. We're gonna concentrate more on the musculoskeletal because that's mostly what you're gonna see in the office to an extent. Now, should you become familiar with these other situations, which is with these other, the neurovascular and neuropathic? Absolutely. Um, because whether you're gonna do this or not, at least recognizing it will allow you to refer this to someone near you that does do this if you, if you don't wanna get involved with it. Okay, next. And these are some of the musculoskeletal or official pain situations. As you can see, it could be temporomandibular joint disorders, masticatory myofascial muscle pain, or tension type headaches. So how do we determine these things? Not only by palpation in, this, in the screeners, but other questions as well. So we need to ask the questions. If you don't ask the questions, you're not gonna get the answers that you're looking for. So next, please. These are some common um, myofascial pain that's referred. And for instance, if you look at the lower right where it says lateral pterygoid, the lateral pterygoid is gonna be um, very affected by oral appliance therapy because the lateral pterygoid constricts to bring the jaw forward. So in this case, you're going to have a patient, maybe their teeth, uh, they're hitting more in anterior dentition and their back teeth aren't touching. What do you do? It could be that the lateral pterygoid is involved. And when we have muscle stretching exercises that we do for that as well. You will see the pain right in front of the ear or by the ear and in, in, in the face right here, okay? Right in the front, in the cheek area. And as you can see, Different muscles refer pain to different parts of, of uh, the head, neck, area, and shoulders. In fact, uh, if you're interested, uh, let's see. I don't know if you can see this, okay? But I got this entire trigger point flip chart with trigger points everywhere in the body, okay? Maybe you can see these as well. And this comes from Drs. Travell and Simons. Travell and Simons trigger point paint charts. I, you know what? This has been great for me over the years. And if you're going to be treating patients anyway, you might as well get this. You know, look online, Travell and Simons trigger point paint charts. They have a, a phenomenal book too. It'll take you probably like half a year to read that. But uh, these charts are lifesavers. 
Next, please. So you have to ask questions. You have to find out from your patient, where is your pain for dealing with that? Is your pain in the temple, temple area and the ear area and the jaw joint? Is it the jaw muscles that you perceive, right? And it's yes or no. And if it's yes, is it the left, is it the right, or is it both that are involved? Next, please. So patients will also have headaches. You're gonna ask the questions, you know, you wake up in the morning with headaches uh, and they may wake up with headaches, maybe tension headaches, right? Uh, you also have migraine headaches or they may say, well, sometimes I get it in the morning, but at night or during the day, and then you need to ask these questions. You know, what causes this problem, right? Is chewing harder, crunchy, or tough foods cause you to have a problem? Is opening your mouth or yawning or, or any jaw habits cause a problem? And if you move your jaw forward or side to side, is a pain better or is it worse or is no different? So these are things you need to assess. It's not hard to ask those questions, but once you get used to it, you'll see that there is a pattern to it and it'll allow you to make the more appropriate decision with this patient. Next, please. So features of a functional screening instrument for TMD. This is where we're getting to. Uh, Shurav in 2008, um, working with oral facial pain and headache, came up with a system. Uh, so this, that would be staff driven, quick and simple with minimum question, minimum questions, and doesn't require uh, the person that's administering to have any clinical or didactic training in TND or even in dentistry, okay? As long as all they have to do is read the questions. Next, please. So the screener can be done, uh, is total six questions. You can do a short version if you don't have enough time, like over the phone uh, or the screener, which already gives you an idea of what you may be dealing with. And the one in six questions takes it into a little more detail. Next, please. Now, when you score this, you need to figure out, depending on, on the, the responses, am I really thinking that this patient may have a TMD issue? Well, take a look on, on, on uh, the lower left. If you have an A response to the questions, zero points. B response, one point. The C response, which only occurs in question number one, gives you two points. And easy to score. If you're doing the three, um, three question version, anything over two, it's a possibility that they have TMD issues. And if you're doing the long version, anything over three will give you the same thought that this patient may be having TMD issues. Uh, so when I do my work for obstructive sleep apnea, I need to take this into account. So I know what device to use, uh, whether we need to uh, deal with pain now, if they're having pain or later. So next one, please. So the three question, uh, the short version is actually, can we move to the next one? Yes, and the next one, next slide. Okay, let's go. No, that's all right. Let's go back to that one, the left. Okay, so I apologize if some of you can't read it. Uh, so one of the questions is in the last 30 days on average, how long did you have any pain in your jaw or temple area on either side? And how long did it last? You could say they had no pain, very brief pain for no more than a week, right? But it stopped or continuous. And then it just goes on. You can read this. And if any of you are interested, uh, I can get you copies of these things. You know, Cindy, if you ask Cindy, uh, contact her and she'll get you copies of whatever we have here. That'll be helpful for you to have in your office. Right, Cindy, is that possible? Absolutely. Okay, I knew it was, that's why I said it. 
I just <laughs> wanted to confer with you. All right, so you can do the, the three question uh, survey or the six question survey. It's not bad at all. Uh, let's say 3B, for instance. Opening your, so in the last 30 days, the, the following activities change any pain, meaning that it make it better or worse or, or no problems or no difference. So opening your mouth and moving your jaw forward or to the side, did that make it better or worse? It's obviously, it's either no or yes, right? Uh, and then you go from there, right? And remember, in the six questions um, version, anything over three gives you an idea that you have uh, TMD issues underlying in addition to having probably an OSA issue. So let's go to the next one, please. Now, is TMD a contraindication for treating OSA with mandibular advancement device? No, absolutely not. In fact, um, very often that's how you treat TMD with oral appliances that allow you to move forward in addition to physical therapy, uh, Botox injections, uh, in some severe or last stitch cases you do surgery, but uh, physical therapy, I, I like that a lot. They, they do a lot of good work on these patients. So, but you need to identify and, and effectively manage these patients, right? Now the patients with OSA and TMD disorder, again, don't try to do everything yourself if you don't feel confident or comfortable with certain, certain modalities, there's nothing wrong with employing another professional, you know, whether it's a, you know, an Atlas orthogonal chiropractor or physical therapist, or a functional therapist, whoever it is, you know, get them involved, get them as part of your team. It will be beneficial for everybody. Okay, next please. So this will give you a synopsis of, of Travell and Simons's trigger point charts. These are the ones you're gonna be looking at more frequently, right? The muscles of mastication uh, that refer pain and that will be mimicking a TMJ disorder. The lateral pterygoid, um, you know that, so the red, more common site of pain, it's also uh, pretty close to where that that uh, muscle is, even though this is more extended. And that'll happen when you bring your mandible down and forward and you keep it there all night with an oral appliance, especially if you haven't done it before. This is something new, so it's different muscles will be contracting, and that's how you develop pain. But again, muscle stretching exercises, identification of the patient and you know, other problem and dealing with it accordingly, okay? Whether it is medication or anti-inflammatories, muscle stretching exercises, whatever it is, be knowledgeable. And if not, talk to somebody that is knowledgeable and they're gonna help you, okay? Good. Next, please. Verbal communications in the office. Again, this is so crucial. This can be done by the hygienist can do this, a dental assistant can do this, a sleep care coordinator is, have you ever been told that sometimes you snore, right? Do you ever wake up with a dull headache? Uh, are you tired during the daytime? Do you take naps? Do you have to take Tums or Rolaids, right? Well, it's a 60% association with acid reflux and obstructive sleep apnea. That's pretty high. That's a pretty significant association. That was an old study, older study. I think it's a lot more prevalent, but we'll go by research and literature and it says 60% association. Do you have any difficulty falling asleep or staying asleep? Maybe you have insomnia. Maybe you don't, but you know, you need to ask the questions and whatever these positive answers are, start thinking, how can we find out what the real problem is? In our office, we want to do a sleep study uh, more frequently because that's how you're going to get the objective, not subjective, but objective uh, result showing you what's really going on with your patient. And do you have a history of anxiety or depression? 
that's that's big too. So look at the medical history also. What medications is this patient taking? Don't just have the patient write it down and keep it as a record. Read, read, you know, what medications this patient's taking? You know, cardiac medications, right? Depression, mood, you know, mood alterations, depression, anxiety, uh, medications, guys for erectile dysfunction. That's also, you know, connected to not getting the, the right flow of air. And that's OSA in this case. Let's go to the next one, please. So general screening and conversation and conversion. So one of the one, uh, good surveys is the Stop Bang questionnaire. It's only eight questions and it can be given by everyone. Actually, you can have this as part of the initial um, paperwork, the intake forms, right? You have the Stop Bang questionnaire. You can have the airport sleeping a scale. And then on that one, the patient gives you their subjective thoughts on, on whether they fall asleep or not, basically, and the what circumstances. I've had patients that say, no, I never fall asleep. And I turn around and they're sleeping in the reception area. <laughs> so ask the questions, you know, be direct. Don't feel embarrassed. Don't feel like you're going to embarrass the patient. If you ask it properly, it's okay. It opens a good dialogue, right? Uh, verbal communications. Have you ever been told that you snore? Take a look in the mouth, right? Tongue size. Look, look beyond the tongue. Can you see their throat at all? Or is it just tongue and soft palate, right? That, that, these are huge red flags. Now, in women, here's the interesting. Women, um, it says it can be more difficult to assess. Not really if you ask the right questions, right? If you know that women may present with different symptoms or they'll express different problems than males do. You know, the males are tired, they snore, what have you, right? Uh, you're looking at them, they may or may not have a big neck. A lot of the times they do. They got a bit of a pot belly. Uh, I know, I'm sorry for saying that. Not everyone does. But we're looking at a different population here when we look at males and females. A lot of times women will come to your office and you'll see a, a slender, um, or not slender, but sometimes you'll see a slender uh, uh, female that goes to the gym all the time and works out all the time and eats well. And yet they have problems with morning headaches, history of anxiety, depression, insomnia, acid reflux. Uh, you'll see those wear facets on, on the molars and you'll see uh, receded gums, right? Loss of attachment. And these are not patients that you will say, oh, well, you have this problem. Let me put you on a occlusal guard and eat soft foods and take an anti-inflammatory. If that patient presents with these symptoms, as far as I'm concerned, they should have a sleep study so that we can get an objective response to what's really going on. And you'll be amazed how often we come back with obstructive sleep apnea uh, being a predominant problem. They may have insomnia, they may have TMD issues also, or the TMD issues could have been caused by the obstructive sleep apnea. So knowing all this, you can very effectively treat the patient so that uh, they stop uh, feeling like nobody's listening. And that happens very often. Patients, the clinicians aren't trained. So they think the patients, let's face it, sometimes you think a patient's wackadoodle, right? Well, or somebody will tell you that I'm referring a patient to you, but they're a little nuts. Well, not really. Maybe that doctor or any other doctor just wasn't able to uh, determine what the problem is. And that is what happens most often. Next, please. So the screening here, the stop bang questionnaire, snoring, do you snore loudly? Pretty much it's a yes or no. Are you tired? Do you feel tired during the day, sleeping during daytime? Has anyone ever observed or uh, seen you to stop breathing at night during sleep? 
Do you have high blood pressure? Or are you being treated for high blood pressure? It's funny, sometimes you tell the, you say to the patient, do you have high blood pressure? And they say, no. Well, then you have to add, are you being treated for high blood pressure? And then it turns out that they'll say yes, because they're taking medications. So the BMI, the body mass index, you look at that, the age of the patient, we knew that as we get older, muscle tone changes, uh, fat distribution changes, there's a laxity uh, in the muscles, even uh, the cells of the tongue, the very posterior aspect of them, the, cell, uh, the cells change and they become not, not as active in moving the tongue. So there's a laxity there as well. Next circumference, gender, right? Next, please. So these are all screeners. You have the TMD screener. You have screeners for obstructive sleep apnea. You have symptoms that you'll find in, in, in both situations, actually in all three, I'm sorry, in orofacial pain as well as TMD, uh, temporal mandibular joint uh, dysfunction, as well as obstructive sleep apnea. The orofacial pain, uh, I, not only do I listen to them, but I have them outlined to me where the pain's coming from, where the pain's going, as far as they can tell. And by looking at the pain distribution, I will look at my charts if I need to. Okay, at this point, most of them I have it down, but every now and then I still go back to these charts on trigger points right here and say, okay, this is where the pain is. This is where it extends. I think it's this muscle. You know, you can actually uh, palpate or squeeze that muscle or, you know, grab it and squeeze it and you can enact uh, the same pain on that patient. Like you can go on the neck and they'll feel pain back here, right? Uh, how many patients have you seen that have had root canals or extractions because of the pain they were having and then they're still having the pain? So study it, it's not difficult, I promise you, it's not difficult. It's just straightforward. And if you concentrate on that, if you help to train your team on this, it's gonna be phenomenal. It's going to be phenomenal because you're and your team's going to really, really enjoy it as well. So the uh, American Academy of Sleep Medicine, right, which is not the dentists, but the doctors, the physicians, the sleep physicians, they came up with a, a practice parameters um, statement back in 2015, which was an upgrade of two previous ones. And what they've say they've said is go see the dentist in a way. Oral appliances, they know are indicated to use in patients with mild to moderate OSA. And in a lot of these patients, you're also going to see that you'll be able to take care of their uh, TMD issues. Now I started using functional appliances back in, was it mid to late eighties. Uh, we're doing it for orthodontic reasons, right? Uh, didn't realize necessarily the effect that we were having on the airway, but we were having patients with pain who started to feel better in addition to correcting uh, some of the problems, especially class two situations. So oral appliances have been around for a long time. Get familiar with them. And each one, basically they all do the same, but each one's a little bit different and it's for a different patient. So, uh, I, I, I veered off, didn't I? Let me go back for a second, uh, Cindy, please. So the physicians have said that these patients should come to us for oral appliance therapy. It says either with mild to moderate OSA who prefer the oral appliances to CPAP or who don't respond or are not appropriate candidates for CPAP or who have failed the attempts with CPAP. That means they tried it, they can't do it, they can't breathe with it, or they don't want to, but the point is they're not using it. So if they're not using it, they're in big trouble, okay? So um, these things should be completed by a dentist with advanced training in sleep medicine. Take a course. If you've taken a course, great. If you need additional training, great. Uh, if you haven't taken any courses, please do. Yeah. Please do because uh, your career will be totally different and that's it. Let's go to the next one.
All right, the next one is the finish line. So let me see, we have a couple of questions here, hold on. So let's take a peek in here. Bum, 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 bum. And they need to be simple questions, okay? Here we go, right? Um, so I have some folks, or some people are already asking me for the recording for this. So yes, everyone, the recording, this is always going to be housed on our Facebook page. Um, but if anybody would like a link for that, uh, we're going to send an email out to everyone in regards to um, some of the handouts, CEs, and so forth. And we can send out the recording that way. So you guys could rewatch that. Um, yeah, a lot of people are asking for these handouts and so forth, which is great. We would love to no. get <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. A lot of the handouts, well, some of the sleep only related ones are on the uh uh on the client portal, right, Cindy? Um, yes. Some so of the more of the customized TMD ones are not, I don't think, but we can get them there. Let's see here. Um all right. So um does anybody have any questions in regards to anything TMD related or anything related to what Dr. Blum said? Um, because I just have a any lot of folks here asking. Any here. questions or any of the statements? Which course do you recommend for additional training on OSA appliances? Well, not to be you know, biased. Back in, uh, back I was in just Japan, you're probably a little biased. <laughs> you know what? I am biased because in 2008, I took my first, I'll call it organized course on sleep. And that was with Sleep Group Solutions. In fact, John, you were there, we did that course in New well, York, yeah. right? Yeah. And I was, I've been using them and I've been using them ever since. And the equipment, the technology, the rhinometer, pharyngometer, I got that, I don't know, was it 2011, I think, mm -hmm. around there, and I've been using it ever since. So uh, I think Sleep Group Solutions will not only give you a course to train you and teach you and show you how to do this, but if, if you need, they also have an entire marketing program with it. They have a business model with it. So they can do so much, okay? Are they the only people that teach courses on OSA? No, no, you can find that a lot of people do, but do you want me to tell you who I think will give you the best deal? I mean, the best courses, the best learning, the best uh, ability to be successful clinically and financially, and you'll feel a lot of reward personally, and that's through Sleep Group Solutions, so. And I know yes. you have a course coming up in Atlanta and then another one in DC in January. So I think Atlanta is next month. And then yes. we're yes. going to have you next in DC month. in January. So you can come to Atlanta in November or come to DC in January. Yes. Let's take a look here. So I have um, someone's asking, they're saying thank you, um, Dr. Blum. So Dr. Karat there as well. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. That's one of my friends. Let me see. Okay, here's a question here. So, um, and, and yes, Dr. Chaudhry, I see your little information here. I'll send you um, uh, copies of the things that we have here. Um, I see a question here where it says, when a patient has a TMD issue and sleep apnea, do they need to refer out for a TMD specialist first? Not necessarily. I don't think so, yeah. No, you know, uh, most of the time you don't. The question is, how much do you know? How much are you willing to learn? Do you want to take care of this problem? Most of the time, when you take care of one problem, right, John, with, you know, there's, there's sleep apnea, you'll be able to take care of their TMD issue. Right. Or you, you know, try to get them out of pain first, right? Which is, again, <laughs> using these oral appliances, most of the time you're able to do, do that. If you need additional help, and because what you did is not taking care of the whole problem, get a physical therapist near you, right? And get them to help you. See what the problem I mean, is. I think something I see in the dental sleep space all the time is people being afraid of exacerbating a pre-existing kind of unknown TMD issue by just treating the, the just addressing airway. Um, but 
in what I've seen, and I, I'm sure Dr. Blum is the same thing, you're you're much more likely to help a a pre-existing joint problem than you are to worsen it by bringing them down and forward in an appliance. Absolutely, that's great. And that's correct. What else? I'm taking a peek here. I don't see any other. Uh, Dr. Beerman says great stuff. Thank you. Um, let me see. Um, Faustina, I don't know if you see any questions on Facebook. And if not, Faustina, do you have a slide with some of our upcoming dates and info we can share? Yeah. Wrong there we go. Oh, we did. Yes, I do. <laughs> I don't know what's in it. It went away, but it was Cindy, there for a second. Cindy was trying to beat me to it. There, there they are. Um, but no, I don't see any questions on Facebook right now. I just took a peek real quick. So just... Just to mention the one in uh, Atlanta, I'll be doing that course. I'll also be teaching the course in Washington, D.C. in January. And in Houston, Texas, hold on. I knew you in were going to do that. In Houston, Texas. Of course you got the hat. Okay. Right? <laughs> in February. Anyway. Awesome. Uh, but whether you come to the course where I'll be there or somebody else will be there, all, all the speakers are, are just really great. Uh, I know them personally. I've known them for years, some of them. And they're just good people. And they're all willing to help you, you know, at any level. And they have great information. So do that. Awesome sauce. I'm looking on here. I don't see any questions. We're going to do some follow-up um, uh, this week and sending out the CEs and some information about um, sleep group solutions offerings and upcoming courses. But again, everyone, thank you so much. I, I still have a nice, decent crowd here in the room here. Um, oh, Dr. Angelo, hugs to you, Maria. I love seeing familiar faces here in our Angela, room. Who is that? <laughs> <laughs> I love him. Um, but seriously, thank you guys again for joining us this evening for Sleep TV. Uh, we'll be back next weekend for another episode. Make sure that you pre-register for that. Um, and again, if you have any other questions or anything that may come up later on, feel free to reach out to me at Sleep Group Solutions, and I'll be more than happy to get those things out for you. So thank you, everybody. Right. Take care, everyone. Stay well. Good night. Bye -bye.